Welcome to the season three finale of Creative Solutions for a New World, Climate and Artist Series. I'm Frances Littman, your host. I'd like to gratefully acknowledge the Coast Salish people of this region and First Nations worldwide. For thousands of years, the abundance that these lands and waters provide us to live, work, and play is due to the reciprocal relationships by which Coast Salish and the world's first people have lived and live today. Please note that today's webinar will be in an hour and a half with an extra half hour from noon to 1230, committed to robust dialogue with our presenters based on your questions. Please be sure to put any questions you may have in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we will endeavor to answer them live. Today's webinar will explore the potential for our society to emerge from the divisiveness that is currently making it difficult to address even the most serious and immediate global threats to a new culture where all voices matter. Solutions are said to be the hallmark of human intelligence. Let's find out what it'll take to get to a place of enlightened communication and implement solutions so as a society, all voices are heard and matter. Today, we are honored to feature best-selling author and award-winning public relations professional, James Hogan. James is the author of I'm Right and You're an Idiot, The Toxic State of Public Discourse and How to Clean It Up, as well as Do the Right Thing, PR Tips for a Skeptical Public, and Climate Cover-Up, The Crusade to Deny Global Warming. His books examine the problem of polluted public discourse and what people can do to improve the quality of conversations. A tireless advocate for ethics and public discourse, James founded the influential online news site, Desmog, named one of Time Magazine's best blogs in 2011. Welcome, Jimmer. There you are. So, hi. hi. Hey, so for more than 30 years, I gather it's coming up almost 40, you had a tremendous career as a partner in one of Western Canada's leading public relation firms, Hogan and Associates in Vancouver, starting in the late 19, or sometime in the 1970s, right? And you pivoted, it seems, from being a highly successful spin doctor, shall we say, for the resource industry, to become a champion of the truth, or someone also known as a whistleblower. So Jim, please tell us today, I'm really, I know our audience is really curious, like what would lead you to realize that misinformation was a major issue in public relations on environmental issues? And how and why did you come to spend five years interviewing more than 75 people about the sorry state of public discourse? Yeah, well, it's, uh, my wife keeps uh, asking that same question because uh, we were kind of just innocently uh, living uh, a great life and I got asked onto the board of the David Suzuki Foundation. This would have been in 2001 or so. And, uh, you know, at the time I thought environmentalists weren't people that I normally would invite over for dinner. Uh, and I was, uh, but when I join uh, a board, I read my board package. I uh, go to every board meeting. I don't think I missed a board meeting all the time I was on the board of the Suzuki Foundation. And we would have these world famous scientists, you know, come and talk to us and Al Gore would come and have dinner with us. And, and after a while, you know, hanging out with Wade Davis and David Suzuki and Miles Richardson and all these kind of famous environmentalists, I started to realize that environmentalists weren't as crazy as I thought they were. We are actually destroying our oceans we're driving record levels of species into extinction and we're dangerously overheating our climate. And the thing that struck me as a communications person, we, one of our, uh, my fellow board members at the time was uh, in those early days was Ray Anderson, the, the CEO of Interface Carpets in the States, this billionaire who became an environmentalist. And he would say, the house is on fire. And, uh, I remember thinking about, about the gap between what Ray was saying and what you would see in the newspapers or in public discourse. And so I started to you know, wonder why, like why is it with all of the science, the sort of unquestionable amount of science behind the seriousness of climate change, we're doing so little about it. How could it be that we know so much and we're doing so little 
you know, why is it we're listening to each other shout rather than trying to, to um, do something about what the evidence is trying to tell us? You know, and why have we come to a, a time when facts don't even seem to matter? And so I decided to uh, start writing about it. Good for you. So can you um, please share some examples of people who maybe misled and divided the public on environmental issues? I can. Give me one second here. Okay. Oh, great. Can you see my, my screen? Not yet. Okay. Just hold on here. Sorry, I'm, I'm not here because I'm like a techie person. <laughs> so in 2012, I was uh, uh, watching the CBC News just after Christmas, and this a woman named uh, Catherine Marshall, who was a spokesperson for a group called Ethical Oil, was interviewed. And this is uh, something that she said that really kind of just stopped me in my tracks. Ethical oil is like fair trade coffee or conflict-free diamonds. It burns the same as conflict oil in your gas tank and it costs the same, but it's morally superior. Boy, that's like natural gas, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it is, uh, it's a very troubling idea and concept. And she went on to say that the Northern Gateway Pipeline, which was going to be in, in British Columbia, bringing oil from the oil sands to the coast of British Columbia, she said it would be good for Canada because it would allow the export of our ethically produced oil to countries uh, that can reduce their dependency on conflict oil. Countries like uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran and Nigeria that don't care anything about the environment or and have atrocious human rights uh, records. And really, she said that we should be supporting this as Canadians and that we should make sure that foreign interests and their foreign funded front groups and lobby groups don't interfere with the pipeline approval process and hijack a sovereign Canadian process. So all of a sudden in a very short clip on national television in Canada, and she was on, she was on in the news for weeks with this message and people weren't even really questioning what she was saying. And all of a sudden we're no longer talking about tankers and pipelines and climate change. We're talking about sovereignty. And it started to get worse because then the federal government, which was conservative at the time, and uh, prime, the, even the uh, Prime Minister Harper was talking about foreign funded radicals. Uh, Nicole Eaton, who's a conservative senator, said that there's political manipulation going on, that there's influence peddling, that millions of dollars are crossing the border masquerading as charitable donations. The natural resources uh, minister at the time was a guy named Joe Oliver, and he accused environmentalists and First, First Nations on the coasts of trying to undermine uh, Canada's economy and block trade on behalf of American oil interests. Uh, he said they're threatening to hijack our regulatory system to achieve their radical ideological agenda. Uh, Environment Minister Peter Kent said there was money laundering going on. And Don Platt, who's now the leader of the opposition in the Canadian Senate said this, where would environmentalists draw the line on where they receive money from? Will they take money from Al Qaeda, the Hamas or the Taliban? In 2019, when Jason Kenney was elected premier of Alberta, he reanimated this foreign funded radicals campaign by unveiling a commission to investigate the shadowy funding, and that's his words, of environmental groups. I mean, you sort of think about this, it kind of seems Russian, you know? Um, but before you turn to the person who you might be sitting next to and uh, say that you didn't know that Canadians were this crazy, Americans had clean coal long before Canada had ethical oil. There are countless campaigns like these that are polluting public conversations around the world. And they're often designed by people like uh, the Washington political consultant, Richard Berman. Uh, in 2014, the New York Times published an article about a speech that Berman gave 
uh, to a group called the Western Energy Alliance, which was a, a group of oil companies involved in fracking. And his speech was secretly recorded and then leaked to the New York Times by actually by an oil guy who was offended by just how radical this guy was. Uh, this is something that Berman said in his speech. He recommended that these oil uh, executives exploit emotions like fear, greed, and anger, and turn them against environmental groups. He said, think of it as an endless war. You can either win ugly or lose pretty. Wow, those are some tactics, you know, and I think it's really valuable that you're sharing these this information, because I'm sure a lot of the youth today who aren't aware of the past news are kind of wondering, how the heck did we get to this place? So this is kind of helping us understand. Thank you. So what did you do next? Well, yeah, so so I, you know, I'm kind of embarrassed by this because I'm probably the most senior public relations communications person in the country, in Canada. And I was watching this thing and I was trying to figure out what are they actually trying to do? Do they actually think anybody will believe this, that oil can be ethical? <laughs> and, uh, you know, it just seemed like such clear manipulation to me. So, so I started writing my book and, and looking at what I was thinking of as Darth Vader public relations. And one of the first people I talked to has become a good friend of mine. His name is Alex Himmelfarb. He was the clerk of the Privy Council and uh, he was a social scientist in Canada. He's now retired. And uh, he told me that I should stop thinking about this as an attempt like of, by someone to persuade. He said, uh, he said this, the strategy is to minimize public spaces where dialogue might occur and where it does occur, confuse it, obscure it, the idea is to kill the debate, not to foster it. Wow, now that's uh, what we're seeing these days, right in, right in front of our eyes. That's right, and it's, it's not people going crazy, it's actually a technique. Uh, he said, it's almost too easy, Jim. They don't have to convince the public of anything to limit public will. They just have to make sure you don't convince the public of anything. And, they, and the way they do that is making it seem as if all the proponents for change are just pursuing their own particular special interests and so doubt that anybody's telling the whole truth. So right after I interviewed uh, uh, Alex, I met this amazing guy who uh, teaches, uh, his name's uh, Jason Stanley. He writes for the New York Times. He's a uh, he teaches philosophy of language and propaganda at Yale. And uh, we met in Harlem in this uh, really busy little coffee shop. And he's one of the most interesting people I've ever met. Um, and he said, when bitumen from Fort McMurray uh, is called ethical oil and coal from West Virginia is called clean coal, the it's really difficult to have a discussion about the real pros and cons. He said, this language is not so much about making substantive claims as it is about silencing. And then he said this, these propaganda campaigns are linguistic strategies for stealing the voices of others. The idea is to silence people by painting them as grossly insincere and undermining public trust in them. So nothing they say can be taken at face value. So I started to understand that polluting the public square with this style of rhetoric is kind of suggesting that there are no such thing as facts. There is no objectivity. Everybody's biased and just trying to manipulate you for their own special interests. So how does, it, how does our tribal ancestry influence our thinking then, Jim? Yeah, well, that was interesting because that's actually the, the darker force that's at work here. And I, the next people that I interviewed uh, were uh, people who study uh, that kind of, uh, what you might call uh, the psychology of teams or, or tribalism, Jonathan Haidt and uh, Dan Cahan. Uh, Jonathan Haidt 
is a social psychologist, a moral psychologist who teaches at New York University's Stern School of Business. And he studies the social psychology of teams. And he makes the argument that human beings are naturally tribal. Uh, we gather into teams. And if you can get people to engage in the psychology of teams, you can shut open-minded thinking down. Here's a couple of things he said. Our righteous minds have been designed by evolution to unite us into teams, to divide us against other teams, and blind us to the truth. Wow. And then he said, we're divided in these highly polarizing ways because some of us are good. We're, we are divided in these highly polarizing ways, not because some of us are good and others are evil, but because our minds were designed for groupish righteousness. And then I ran, then I interviewed this guy who was like, he's probably the most terrifyingly smart person I've ever met. So he, he's a law professor at Harvard, or sorry, at Yale uh, Law School. And he's also a PhD. And he studies something called cultural cognition. And he said, it's kind of worse than what Jonathan Haidt is talking about. He said, we, we actually want to be misled. So this thing that he studies, cultural cognition, is the tendency of individuals to conform their beliefs about disputed matters of fact uh, to the values of their cultural identity. Uh, he said that we resist information that threatens our identity. And when we're under the spell of cultural cognition, we develop elaborate rationalizations to justify our beliefs even when they're false and evidence points strongly in another direction. He said, we engage in a kind of selective thinking. It doesn't even matter how well-educated and well-informed we are. That has nothing to do with it. In fact, some of the research they did showed that people who are better educated can be worse at this. Uh, anyways, he said, what we look for what conform conforms with our beliefs and we ignore information that contradicts those beliefs and and basically when scientific evidence is cloaked with this team meaning or people are under the spell of cultural cognition, our minds close. So is that to say we shouldn't be in teams? We shouldn't have groups and we shouldn't have organizations? No, in fact, that's a, you know, being part of communities is a good thing. <laughs> Great. This, this, is, this is that um, that we have to be very careful to uh, to be questioning the beliefs uh, of our own group. Uh, he said this, this isn't something, he said, this is what happens with cultural cognition. You take and you massage team meaning into science. And then the science becomes, this isn't something people like us believe. If you do believe this, you can't be one of us. You must be one of them. So the us and them, the good old us and them, dividing. Right. But it's, but it's a, it's a, an incredibly powerful force that's at work here. I interviewed this woman, uh, in, in this incredible woman who wrote a best-selling a book called "Mistakes Were Made, But Not by Me," and uh, she lives in the foothills under that big Hollywood sign in Los Angeles, and she's very, really incredible woman, very generous with her time. And she said that the moment we make a decision, human beings will begin to look for the reasons that they're right about the decision they made and overlook the suggestions that they could be wrong. And she said that this self-justification process protects us from something uh, she calls cognitive dissonance or she studies cognitive dissonance. Uh, she said that uh, the more time, effort, and money that you, and, and face, that public face especially, that you attach to a decision, the harder it is to admit you're wrong. So we find ways to defend our mistakes rather than facing the alternative, which is to admit that we've done something stupid or unethical or incompetent. And she said that it's a powerful process that is as uncomfortable as hunger or thirst that the mind is highly motivated to reduce this feeling. And she said this, 
the greatest danger we face on the planet is not only from bad people doing corrupt, evil, and bad things, but also from good people who justify the bad, evil, and corrupt things they do in order to preserve their belief that they are good, kind, and ethical people. And so the next person I talked to was this interesting guy. His name is Roger Connor, and he teaches at uh, Vanderbilt Law School in Nashville. And he wrote a really incredible article uh, called The Advocacy Trap. The way it starts is, the way he started to explain it was this. He said, most of us aren't evil. Good people do bad things for good reasons. And if we don't understand this, we can fall into this advocacy trap. And he said, this is one of the things he said, I believe it's possible to think that someone is completely wrong, but also believe that they are decent people who have just somehow got it wrong. Uh, his, his view is that the advocacy trap starts when people, people disagree with us. Especially, this is like a public phenomenon. And if we say, if we have a strong belief about something and we say it publicly, um, we don't like being contradicted or criticized, especially in public. Uh, so when people disagree with us, first we may just question their views and try and correct them and give them more facts and evidence to show that they're not correct. But if they persist, we may start to, to question their motivation and their actual personal intentions and their character. Uh, and eventually, it's not just that they're wrong, they, they become wrongdoers and we start to perceive them as aggressors. And they turn from opponents into enemies. And eventually, defeating our opponent becomes more important than the actual issue that we were talking about to begin with. It becomes very difficult to collaborate with someone that you consider despicable and unethical. And so the idea here is that it, you can be totally right about the issue, but completely wrong about the way you deal with it. And if what I think is true and what some of these people have told me is true is that the real heart of propaganda is polarization. You can end up helping the propagandist even though you're right on the issues just by the way that you have the conversation which is why I also started eventually to um, talk to spiritual leaders. But so Roger Connor, like if we ask ourselves the question of uh, how we reopen the commons, because this problem of polarization, another way of looking at it is that we basically have closed down the commons. We've closed the public square. If no one can trust anything anyone says except the group they belong to, there is no public square. And so how do you reopen it? So he says, Roger Connor says, that we escape the advocacy trap when we choose a stance of respect, empathy, and compassion. People can be completely wrong and still be decent people. But I would add to that, you know, as a 20 year advocate for the environment and who's you know, been at the elbow of David Suzuki in the middle of all these issues for a lot of decades, you can't be naive. Disinformation campaigns like foreign funded radicals and big green radicals are not just opinions. These are deliberate attempts to fracture society and pollute public discourse. They create division, that's their purpose and you can't be naive and ignore that. But nevertheless, you still have the job as the bigger person to diffuse polarization and not magnify it. And I got this ad advice from a lot of people. Jason Stanley said, you too could unknowingly be under the influence of bias. Uh, Steve Rizel, who's a guru on social, a social scientist and a guru on dialogue said, remember, you could be wrong. Yeah, I think it's like check your bias at the door and, and we have to keep putting a magnifier on ourselves and looking at that, right? Yeah. and so. I was at, the, uh, I went to this talk. I used to be on the board of the Dalai Lama Center in Vancouver and uh, Karen Armstrong came to talk. She's like a best-selling author. Most people here probably have heard about her. And she, anyway, she won the TED prize and they gave her $200,000 to make the world a better place. So she gathered all these people together uh, to write the charter for compassion, all these different religious leaders. 
And she was more concerned about religious violence around the world and sort of say, uh, you know, the strife that goes on between various religions. And um, I just listening to her, I realized that she could be talking about climate change, <laughs> the debate around climate change. So I interviewed her. And this is one of the things she said, look into your own heart, discover what gives you pain and refuse under any circumstances whatsoever to inflict that pain on anyone else. Never treat others as you would not like to be treated yourself. Good advice that's been given a long time. <laughs> that, she said, is the essence of all religion. All religions have the golden rule, right? Mm -hmm. She also said, we need to speak out against injustice, but not in a way that causes more hatred. Remember what St. Paul said, charity takes no delight in the wrongdoing of others. You know, weirdly, the, probably the person we all look to when we, when we think about propaganda agrees in a way. He said, it appears to me that one defeats the fanatic precisely by not being a fanatic oneself, but on the contrary, by using one's intelligence. And intelligence, as we said earlier, is a solu solutions <coughs> are the uh, hallmark of human intelligence. So here we go, looking for those solutions. That's right. And so I, I, um, as I was finishing my book, you know, this, I was getting this idea about polarization. I, I, somebody sent me a PBS special where Bill Moyers was interviewing Harvard Mar Marshall Gantz, who's this, he, he's the, the biggest chapter in my book and I'd already interviewed him. He was one of the, he was an advisor to, uh, a communications advisor to um, Obama in his elections. And uh, he teaches public narrative and social change. And they were having this social change conversation. I have a lot of respect for him. Anyway, so Gantz says, we should never be afraid of the controversy that arises from speaking the truth. There is nothing wrong with a good fight over injustice. He said he has no time for people who are criticizing polarization, people who are saying we all need to get along better. And he said, polarization can be a good thing it's what makes democracy. It can have good outcomes. So I was kind of like, I thought, whoa, boy, I'm on the wrong track here. So I phoned him and he said, look, Jim, you should read Rabbi Hillel. And I said, who's Rabbi Hillel? And he said, well, he was, a, he was around at the time of Jesus, but he didn't have as good a marketing people. And, and he said that what Rabbi Hillel said was the goal of, uh, that, that there's two types of public debate. One of them is intended to crush your opponent and the other one to unveil, he called it argument for the sake of heaven, is to get to the truth of a matter. And that one of them is good for us and one of them is bad. And uh, that we should, and people should be, you know, should be encouraged to hold different points of view but it's the purpose of it should not be to crush people who disagree with you. Mm -hmm, definitely. So we need we're, we need to shift to an enlightened conversations and change this paradigm. So all great words of wisdom. And you've met several other leaders too, right? I had this amazing. I got this amazing phone call. You know, one of the things that happens when you're hanging around David Suzuki is you run into all sorts of famous people. And I got this phone call saying. Thich Nhat Hanh would like you to do some communications work or his people would like you to do some communications work. He's visiting Vancouver and I thought, oh my God. So this ended up being, a, a, you know, going into another call and they said they'd, he'd, they'd also like you to introduce him to David Suzuki. So I ended up at UBC having tea with Thich Nhat Hanh and David Suzuki and Gregor Robertson, the mayor of, of Vancouver. And uh, right away, Thich Nhat Hanh started convincing Suzuki and I he was talking about he said, people know they're destroying the planet. You need to deal with the despair. And you should both meditate because uh, the inner ecology is the most important ecology. And, and I said, uh, you're not saying we shouldn't be activists, are you? And he had this, I don't know if you've ever been with anybody like this, but I was like sitting two feet away from him. And he looked at me. And I felt like he was peering into the depths of my soul, you know, into places I've never been aware of. And he said this, speak the truth, 
but not to punish. And this for me, you know, I remember walking off the stage and my wife was sitting in the front row when all the cameras were turned off and everything. And, and she said, you remember what he said, right? You remember what he said, speak the truth, but not to punish. And this happened years ago. And I have never stopped thinking about this. You know, it took me maybe about six months and I realized that I'd been given a Zen koan by one of the great living Zen masters. And this is kind of the essence of the job for someone who wants to change the world. You've got to learn to speak the truth, but not to punish. And it doesn't hurt to meditate. Let me tell you, it sure brings the stress level down, James. And I know that you were, a, you were a, you're, a, you're an avid meditator and even taught it at one point in your career. That's right. And I continue, uh, I mean, to do it. And it's a, an unbelievable gift that I hope everyone uh, takes advantage of. So I have to wrap up, but I, I just want to say this, that if we want to stop destroying the oceans and driving record levels of species to extinction, and dangerously overheating the climate, we need to do something about the polluted public square. And I think this is how. Uh, right near um, the end of my book, I went to Dharamsala and I spent a week with the Dalai Lama talking about the environment. Anyway, I got to interview him pr privately. It was one of the most terrifying experiences. I was so nervous. Anyway, right at the end of the whole interview, he reached out and put his finger on my forehead and he said this, sometimes the Western brain looks more sophisticated, but in Tibet, we operate from the heart and this is very strong. So combine these two, the Asian heart and the Western mind, and then we will have real success, real success. For me, what I learned was this, if we want to move justice and right thinking and right action forward, we need, if we want science and evidence to be at the center of and take their proper role in public conversations, we need to excel at empathy. The Dalai Lama basically teaches that it's the negative emotions that we have that are the troublemakers and that we need to bring more warm heartedness and compassion into public conversations. And so I think it's something that we all need to be really, really good at. And the way we get good at it is being deep listeners, speaking from the heart and to the heart and learning to tell stories of us because the purpose behind propaganda is to divide. The purpose behind right speech is to draw people together. And so that's what I learned from uh, my five years with all of these brilliant uh, people. And I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to share this. Oh, thank you, Jim. I mean, what an experience you've had. What a life. And, you know, I love how you... Um, Basically, what you're saying is to focus on the positive as well. Like, let's not get all wrapped up in the negative because we attract more negativity when we give that energy to it. So staying focused on what we want, but remaining positive. So we'll be speaking more with you during the Q&A around noon today, as I, you know, there's already lots of great questions. So now I'd like to introduce three and incredible community leaders, starting with Ella Kim Marriott. Ella is a UBC Honors graduate in Sociology, Environment and Society, and she will be starting her master's degree in the Resource Economics and Environmental Sociology program at the University of Alberta in the fall. Uh, Ella's passion aligns with environmentalism and social justice, and her recent research interests have been focused on just transitions for workers and communities that will be impacted by green industry shifts. I'm also delighted to share that Ella has just recently joined Creatively United to as uh, our social media and community outreach person. Welcome, Ella. So can you please share with us when and why you became involved with climate action and why you will soon be leaving the beautiful West Coast to live in Fort McMurray? Yes, I can. So first of all, thank you for having me on the panel today. 
Uh, that was a really great presentation from Jim. I really enjoyed it. Uh, so for climate action, I would say I've been involved with climate action since as early as elementary school. I was in my, my school's green club, but back then we mostly only talked about the ozone layer and recycling. So obviously things have changed a lot since then, uh, but I was also raised by an environmentalist and growing up in Vancouver, surrounded by nature, I feel like it was just ingrained in me from really early on. But when I started to get more serious with activism was more so in high school when I started to attend protests and did demonstrations with the environmental club at my school. Uh, and I started to be more active on all of my platforms and volunteered with groups like Greenpeace and SPEC. And around grade 10 is when I think environmentalism and social justice really started to be my passions. And I knew from that point on that I wanted to pursue them in university. And so that's why I decided to study the impact that humans have on the environment in university. And then I wrote my undergraduate thesis on the topic of energy transitions, as you mentioned. So yeah, so I'll be moving to Alberta in September to start my master's program and I'm hoping to kind of continue that work I did in my undergrad thesis. So my thesis was sort of like a pilot project of what I'm hoping to pursue. But basically what I did for the thesis was I interviewed eight fossil fuel workers about their thoughts and concerns and opinions regarding a transition to cleaner energy and I, yeah, I really want to continue with this research in my master's and I'm hoping that I'll be able to go to Fort McMurray and live there for a portion of time and kind of integrate myself into the community through some of the interviewees that I, I met when I did my pilot project. And I want to just quickly say one of the biggest takeaways I had from my project, which was that only one of the eight workers that I interviewed had heard of a just transition. And so I think that's really telling of the lack of dialogue between people like myself that are environmentalists and fully identify that way uh, and people that are really on the other side of an issue like the fossil fuel industry and energy transitions. And the other thing I took away from it was that everyone I interviewed was really engaged in our conversation and they were really willing to speak to me. And uh, they were really interested in my research. And so I, it's not, I don't think it's that they don't want to participate in these conversations, at least from my experience so far. I think it's really that uh, like Jim has worked on for so long, there's this polarization and like this expectation that it's gonna be really difficult to have those conversations. But when you kind of boil things down and try to find common ground, I think it's easier than people make it out to be. Well, I can see why they would find it easy to talk to you, Ella. I mean, you're so articulate and I just can't believe you've started this, like you've done this for so long. And you're, you didn't have a, a traditional childhood that maybe my generation had, where we weren't even thinking about this stuff. So all I can say is I'm glad that the world has you. And I understand that you have volunteered as a policy analyst for the BC Council for International Cooperation's youth-led climate change branch and worked on a survey that explores the concerns and opinions of BC youth regarding climate change. Can you please share with us what you've heard or learned from that experience? Yeah, definitely. So for the survey we did, we've only done the trial survey so far because COVID kind of got in the way of us getting lots of schools to participate. So we're hoping to collect more data in the future. And I can kind of combine what we observed from the survey with my experience going into schools presenting for Green Speakers, which is Greenpeace's educational program. So honestly, what I've noticed from doing that is that students really know a lot about climate change already. Like the students that are currently in elementary school and high school, I think it's been incorporated into the curriculum a lot more already than when I was even in school, like I mentioned when I was in school, we were mostly talking about like the ozone layer and recycling and maybe composting. And then by high school, we started to talk about global warming a bit, but now climate change really is a key word. And I think a lot of youth know a lot about it already. Uh, and they're also, they have all these other sources to learn from, like social media is a huge platform for youth to learn from. And so I, I think they know a lot already and honestly, I think what they really want is more action. And that's kind of what we saw from the survey was they were uh, saying that they felt like they were talking about climate change enough among themselves and in their schools, but they wanted to see the governments that represent them doing more. 
And I think they really want adults that have access to all these tools that they don't have, like voting and advocacy and you know building their businesses in a sustainable way and really being part of decision making. They really want adults to do the things that they are not necessarily able to do that will impact their future so drastically. Absolutely. So like helping them get the vote at maybe 16, because if they can drive a car and pay some tax and, and be working and uh, contributing to society, it seems to me that they should be able to vote too. And, and is there a Greens data, a jobs database for Canadian youth? And, and if so, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so this is something I'm really excited about that I've also been working on through BCCIC. And it's not finalized yet, but it's been a really amazing process because I've been along with the team and doing research into what green jobs exist and uh, our database is still being developed but so far we have 100 jobs on the database. And what's really cool about it is that a lot of the jobs on it are newly emerging and a lot of them don't even necessarily exist yet they might exist in the next two to five to 10 years, um, but it really gives you a good vision and a good idea of what the future can actually look like and how different it can be from what we have in place right now. And I think it's really important to have something like that for youth to really grab onto that's tangible, especially when youth nowadays, I think we have to grow up with climate change on our minds, whether we like it or not, we can't really plan our futures without thinking about how climate change is going to impact our careers and where we live and whether or not we have kids and like all these factors that I think past generations maybe didn't have to take into consideration so much. So uh, making a green jobs database for youth, I think is going to be really useful for them to make them feel like, first of all, they can have a great future and that there is this potential society that we can build uh, that is you know, fully renewable energy, fully sustainable. And uh, there's so many different routes that they can go in within that. And it doesn't just have to be like, you know, obviously I'm a climate activist and Naomi is, and it's amazing to have all these climate activists, but I think some people might not fall into that category. So to know that there's like so many different fields you can go in to help move in this direction, I think will be really valuable. Won't it though? We're just at the beginning of a renaissance. It's really exciting. I remember as a kid studying history and thinking, I wonder if the people knew back then that they were in a renaissance when we read about the renaissance and what that would have been like. And we're in it. I'm sure that's it. This is this is the transition that we get to witness and it's really exciting. And so I'm thrilled that you are helping us with social media for Creatively United because we have lots of solutions there and, and a lot of the things that you're talking about people can find there. So thank you, Ella. We'll chat more with you during our Q&A session between noon and 12.30. So now I would like to introduce Naomi Liang. She's a 17-year-old climate and racial justice activist. She is a second-generation immigrant with parents from Malaysia and Hong Kong, and a settler on the unsurrendered Musqueam and Tuasin First Nations territories in Richmond, BC. Naomi is active with Climate Education Reform BC, the Sustainability Teams, and Climate Strike Canada. Welcome, Naomi. So please tell us a bit about the organizations you are part of and what got you involved in the work you do as a youth climate activist. Absolutely. Thank you so much, yeah, for inviting me here. And thank you, Jim, for your presentation and Ella as well. I really appreciated um, all the points that you brought up. Um, yeah, so again, um, thank you so much um, for that great introduction. Um, yeah, so the most, of, most of the work I do is with Sustainability Teens, a movement of youth across Metro Vancouver advocating for climate justice, which is justice for people on the planet. And I'm sure if you're here, you're aware of that. Um, but yeah, we act because we know that we need a more sustainable, equitable, and just world that takes big, that, and that we need to take big steps um, to get there. And you might know Sustainability Teens from the youth, um, the climate strike in 2019 that we organized where over 100,000 um, youth um, yeah, went to the streets and we all advocated together there. I remember yeah, just thinking back and how um, impactful it felt just to see streets full of people all believing in the same um, purpose. And we also, uh, Sustainability Teens helped pass one of North America's um, most comprehensive and um, yeah, detailed climate emergency action plan, which then um, has helped to get um, other municipalities across um, Canada also, um, yeah, releasing climate emergency action plans. 
And yeah, so that's one of the groups that I do work with. And then the second group is Climate Education Reform BC. And we are a group of youth across the province advocating for our educational system to teach us about the climate emergency. Also for our educational system, not only to teach about the problem of climate change, which like Ella said, our schools are doing, are doing somewhat well right now, um, but I think also talking about the solutions to climate change, the urgency of the climate change, um, the urgency of climate change, and also the gravity of the problem. And so, yeah, the, the gist of what we are doing is that um, we're advocating for our educational system to prepare us um, for the most urgent and defining issue of our time. So over the past few months, we've been meeting with teachers, climate education researchers, scientists, and really, yeah, hosting spaces for us to talk with teachers, students, um, as well as with parents about how they feel about climate change, how they feel about our schools, um, and it, how they're currently teaching about it. Um, are you getting good uptake? Like, are you finding that the teachers and yes, you're getting good response? Yeah, we're getting a lot of supportive teachers. And actually just recently we were endorsed by the BC Teachers Federation. Um, and yeah, so it's really just like the initial stages of our campaign. We've been also talking with um, a researcher named Ellen Field and she conducts study, a st she conducted a study about climate education in classrooms and I'll just send it in the chat here. And um, what, what she actually found is that um, students and I think Canadians really just think that they are more informed about climate change than they actually are and that the majority of them are not getting their um, sources directly from researchers and scientists and so um, in that survey she also found that all most teachers um, agreed that they should be teaching about climate change but that they also needed more resources to do so. Yeah the, the core of what we're advocating for um, and I can I think it's our website has been sent in the chat, but I can send it um, again later too. And we have- we'll, we'll post it with the replay as well. we'll yeah, post awesome, it. thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, and so we, are, we um, have essentially released like our needs for the um, BC Ministry of Education. And yeah, we're really just advocating and building pressure for that right now. So and, you also mentioned climate and racial justice. How do those two aspects of your work overlap? Yeah, absolutely. I really appreciate um, this question. Um, and so like you mentioned, growing up um, as an Asian person and second generation immigrant with parents from Asia, I didn't really see voices um, like my own really prominent in media or really centered in the environmental movement. And I guess I didn't know where I fit into the environmental movement because it is very um, white dominated. And um, I guess unlike um, Ella, my parents are not environmentalists. Um, I think they are, they appreciate nature and they really um, have been great raising me with that. But I think um, it just hasn't been within my family's culture. And I know um, a lot of my community um, doesn't really um, have, hasn't had that opportunity um, because environmentalism has been somewhat inaccessible um, to them. And so I think coming to understand how environmentalism often looks different for people of color because of how, for instance, the environmental movement historically um, has not really celebrated um, certain voices or has excluded certain voices. I think that has definitely influenced the work that I do. And so, um, yeah, I really advocate for racial justice because there is no climate justice without equity um, and justice for all people. And so this includes Indigenous sovereignty, Black Lives Matter, Stop Asian Hate, um, justice for global South communities, and really, yeah, justice for all people. And I guess with the theme of this webinar, it's, um, yeah, all voices matter. And this is absolutely so, so true. And yeah, I guess to get to that justice aspect, we must consider whose voices have been historically excluded and whose voices we need now in this environmental movement and um, yeah, for, so for instance, I know um, oftentimes like a lot of white youth activists get a lot, a lot of media and attention, but at the same time, like indigenous activists who've been doing this work for generations um, maybe are not centered in this movement and maybe are not listened to as much. And so, um, yeah, I think um, 
a lot of the work that I do now has to do with like, um, yeah, pointing back to um, indigenous solutions, which should be treated like science, indigenous solutions, um, and, and standing um, in solidarity with other movements because um, yeah, we can't, we can't fight for climate justice without fighting for racial justice. And I think that's something that needs to be very much centered in our movement. So. Well said, Naomi, thank you. And, and do you have one immediate call to action for us? Yeah, I do have um, you. <laughs> I know you're at school right now, and you. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, someone just opened the door. Not at school. <laughs> um, so you can sign on to our open letter here, and then we also have action toolkits um, for you to take action. And we're also, yeah, we're in the process of also looking for endorsements. So yeah, we would really appreciate it if you wanted to send us an email um, or check out our endorsement toolkit on our website. Okay. And thank you so much for thank you, here Naomi. Today. I know you've got to run and unfortunately can't stay for the Q&A, but we'll we'll get questions to you if anyone has them and we'll put them with our replay. OK, thank, thank you. you so much, Naomi, for joining us. Mm -hmm. So joining us again for this webinar is Charlene George. Charlene is a member of the South people on the west coast of Vancouver Island and a cultural guide. She believes we must strive to better balance our relationship with each other, Western and Indigenous knowledge systems and ways of knowing. Heichka Charlene, and thank you so much for coming back. Welcome back. Uh, you have such an incredible uh, depth of knowledge. What sage wisdom might you like to contribute to today's conversation with respect to enlightened communication and making all voices matter? Each while, um, for being invited to all of the voices who spoke before me, not only previous to today, but also to today. So a short time ago, we celebrated that a work is done. Um, a pathway together. And I'm going to put the link into the chat box in a moment. But um, what I want to do is ask you to pause. I'm inviting you to pause. Um, there's so many things that are adversarial in our world and in our space and in our thinking, especially as humans. And I would say each while to all the relatives, and I'm not just talking to the humans. So these are the voices that are absent. And until we can have all of our absent voices to be at the table, to be equal at the table, there is no table. There is just a bunch of humans and a certain class of humans that feel that they are entitled to define what is nature and make that a label, which means that it is in essence in a hierarchical model, which is still a triangle. And what I'm saying is I'm inviting you to pause, pause and consider. And um, I would encourage us to move away from the terminologies that divide us, such as good and evil, such as anything that creates a dichotomy, it creates an opposition for how we think and how we feel. Um, and I really appreciated the comment of putting on a new pair of glasses from our, our first speaker, um, where we allow that there were more than one possibility. And as you can see my hair and what I had on my screen to share with you was some beautiful artwork. Um, and maybe we can share some of that afterwards. Um, but I'm gonna invite for you to think from the time of gray. So when we all as humans come to the time of gray or when you see the, the beautiful tree um, relative that grandparent is turning gray, they are coming to a place that is very different than when you're new. When you're new, everything is a dichotomy. It is black and white. And in that creates issues, creates possibilities for divisions to happen. Just like at Ferry Creek just recently, those, those lovely men that came and had were a target. They were a bullet that was directed by some people who knowingly set them up to be confrontational with some of the other humans that are there trying to bring awareness. And if we allow ourselves to be in that place, we allow ourselves to be used that way. So I would like you to take a moment and pause and um, to consider how could we work ourselves out of a job? If we're an environmentalist, this is the most important part that we need to think about. How can we work ourselves not to be here, not to be needed. What an incredible thought that could be. And what would it take to get there? 
who needs to be at the table. The other part that I'm gonna um, close with here briefly is if we started making our present decisions as humans, as fellow human beings, as we, as if we were already in the future, as great grandparents, as grandparents, as grandparents, how would we then consider and make our decisions and have our thinking? We wouldn't be arguing over the small bits of what kind of representation of wealth goes into your pocket or into your pile so you can say that I have the most, I'm the best, and that's my system evaluation. One of the reasons why we had such a difficult time in our first conversations with um, the visitors that came to be here that didn't understand the protocol was that we had a different sense of value. We valued very much um, each breath of life from the smallest to the biggest. And that that's, is a cultural statement that I'm saying that's equated into English. And if we value from the smallest, which is Miss COVID, how many people are mad at this tiny, tiny microscopic new relative that's come to join us? Well, you know what? Your mad is feeding all of the part that is creating negativity. What are you taking from today? How can you pause? You're being offered the moment to pause. Are you not going to take it and enter your new day, go outside your door, put on a fresh pair of glasses, consider making decisions from the place of being great grandparents as grandparents as grandparents. What would you tell yourself how you could consider and I'm not going to tell you how to be, but I'm going to ask and invite you to consider. Haichka, haitsapka. Haichka. Oh, such words. Of, they just touch me so deeply. Like, seriously, everything you say, Charlene, it just makes so much sense. And I thank you for joining us. And I hope you can stick around. I know you have some very pressing family business right now to deal with. But if you can be on the show if it, it, and we'll come back if we see you with questions, we already have tons of great questions to delve into. So I'd like to thank our audience and thank our presenters. So I'm going to just sort of dive into questions. So uh, here's a question for the panel, I guess. Um, I've got quite a few here. <laughs> the recent decision by the Facebook oversight panel to contribute to continue the ban on Donald Trump's access to Facebook has raised questions and concerns about free speech and whether social media should self-regulate misinformation and lies on its sites. Do you think that social media can and should regulate itself? I'm going to let Ella take that one first before we go to you, Jim, if you don't mind, if she wants to. Do you want to take that, Ella? Um, yeah, sure. I can take that. I, well, the thing with social media that's interesting that I only know, you know, a fraction about, that's not my, my general area. It's more based on my own experience and using it as a tool for my own activism and everything. But we're already very much engulfed in like our own um, information sources on our media. Like we only see what we believe in to start with because of the algorithms and everything that are set for us. So I think that censorship is, is interesting because it will only impact, um, or not only impact, but you know, it'll, um, it'll impact specific views more strongly. And a lot of the people that have those views have stronger opinions. So they are the ones that are going to get the most upset about it. So it's definitely like a, a complicated thing that I think we have to take into account. But I also think that there's kind of a line where for instance, with Trump's tweets, which I think is what the, the person asking the question was referring to, there were certain tweets that he was making where if he was ever to say that, um, you know, during a speech in person, that wouldn't be allowed, that, you know, that, that wouldn't fly. And so I think there is definitely a line where um, I, you know, if it's, if it's verging on hate speech, I think obviously that's a completely different thing. And that's when I think censorship definitely becomes more appropriate. Uh, but maybe Jim has further comments on that. Thank you, Ella. Jim, did you want to weigh in or should we jump to another question? Uh, yeah, no, I'd love to weigh in on this if, if, if that's all right. Sure. So, so one of the things that um, I realized with my book, I did a second edition of my book because I hadn't done anything about social media. And, you know, you can probably see why from the 
trouble that I had at the beginning of my presentation. Uh, you probably should take what I have to say about social media with a grain of salt. But one of the things that I, uh, that I realized in looking at social, the role of social media in propaganda is the algorithms work the same as propaganda does. So the algorithms favor division. They favor emotions that divide, hate, fear. Uh, and these are very powerful. And Donald Trump is like a hate and fear guy, right? He's a dividus guy. Um, I don't think the solution is in censorship. I think the solution is in regulation. Uh, I think that there should, in, in a way, I think Facebook and Twitter and a lot of these social media sites either need to change their their the model of, of uh, making money or and, and maybe become like a library because it's good that people have these public conversations but when you when you use these algorithms to um, improve ad, the quality of advertising and the ability to kind of follow you around and all that that's all about eyeballs right and so those algorithms basically need to be, uh, shouldn't be, I think if, I think what ends up happening if there's uh, advertising money involved in it, the algorithms are gonna be mischief makers and they're gonna divide people. I think Facebook has done way more to divide the world than Donald Trump. Fascinating, isn't it? Okay, thank you. This question is for the entire panel, anyone who wants to jump in. Are you hopeful that we can change from the current pan path of divisiveness and misinformation to a more enlightened and engaged future for communication and why? Yeah, and that's the basis of um, my conversation today is exactly that. Um, you are allowing a point of view of somebody who is benefiting more than you and definitely more than any future children's children's children. Are you going to continue to allow that? Yes, because you're not just speaking for yourself. I love that seven generation concept. That's beautiful. Thank you. Anyone else just want to say anything or should I move on to the next question? I'll mention something. I am hopeful and it's mostly again based off of my own experience, but I find that everyone I've ever engaged with that has a different perspective than me, if I really give them the time to say what they are thinking without just jumping in and cutting them off or telling them that they're wrong without hearing them out. Normally people are kind of thankful for that because they don't experience that very often. So I think there's a lot of power in changing how we have conversations and knowing that it's possible to have civil and respectful debates. Uh, and, and there's lots of strategies to do that. But I think some important things to keep in mind are like, finding common ground to start with, and it can be completely unrelated from the topic at hand, but relating on something is, is a really useful tool. Uh, and yeah, and also giving people the time to fully explain themselves. And I, I think the biggest thing to avoid is just telling someone that they're wrong without hearing them, because it's also going to improve your own perspective and your own argument to actually know what other people are thinking. Uh, and that's another issue with the algorithms on social media is we can really, uh, if we have censorship and all that kind of stuff, we can live in this world and reality of our own where we kind of think that these other opinions don't exist when they do and we need to address them face on. So yeah, I think really giving people the room to, uh, to talk to you and to explain things. And that's kind of my hope with talking to fossil fuel workers that I feel like don't have many positive interactions with environmentalists. And that's on from both ends. Uh, I think there's a lot of um, tension on both ends, so. Exactly. James, I'm gonna give you a question that kind of is directed like this as well, but it's sort of two in one. Can you provide an example where you were successfully engaged with someone from being divisive and obstructive to being engaged? And were you successful and how did you go about it? Yeah. Um... One of the things that Jonathan Haidt told me is that there's a fair amount of, uh, this is kind of like what Ella was just saying, uh, that there's a fair amount of research done on the power of acknowledgement, that you, that you, if you acknowledge what it is that um, uh, someone else is feeling or someone else is thinking, they're more likely to, to listen to you. So I recently had an email exchange with 
uh, someone who was reading my book and he was an American who's against regulation. And regulation, anti-regulation movement, the anti-regulation movement is like at the heart of a lot of our problems. And so I strongly believe <laughs> that, that industry needs to be regulated and cracked down on. Like self-regulation is no regulation. And so anyway, this guy emailed me and he was taking issue with the fact that I seem to be in favor of regulation and that I was uh, using the word climate change denial. And he thought that I was like, I was bringing this bias in and creating the very thing that my book was about not doing. And, you know, I said, well, you know, I apologize if I did do that, but you should know that I've been like a corporate PR guy for 35 years. And the one thing I've learned is the last thing you want to do is have industry regulating itself. You need to be criticizing. You, you need to, you need to have the regulation, even though everything's not perfect. I know government's not perfect. And we need to be ready to, to criticize and hold them to account. We need to be able to criticize and hold industry to account. But, so, so, but the way I talked about it was from the position of someone who basically shared this guy's politics. And uh, like, I'm a free enterprise guy, I'm a business guy. And so that actually helped open up the space to have the conversation, but it allowed me not to agree with something that I don't agree with, but to, to hold my position at the same time that I didn't disrespect his, because I knew this guy was coming from a good place. But because I let him talk or he talked in his email, I knew his heart was in the right place. It's easier to do that with someone whose heart's in the right place. Somebody's heart's not in the right place and they're trying to mess with you. That's a totally different uh, kind of thing. But I would also say that actually Climate Cover-Up was a book about beating people up who are denying climate change. Uh, industries and calling them out and calling them liars when they're liars and everything. I'm right and you're an idiot is about the Dalai Lama and Thich Nhat Hanh. So those two books kind of do it as well, right? Exactly. So those are great examples of advocacy, advocacy done skillfully and with balance, right? With the compassion and yet the, um, <coughs> yeah, the accountability. So let's, let's keep going here. Um, how can uh, we use the brain's tendency to tribal thinking in ethical ways? Is it to be inclusive and acknowledge their, their, their needs? Ethical. Um, so these are terms instead of an invitation into our relationship. Mm. If we are respectfully inviting relationships to happen, we are not going to create a place where we need to consider ethics. We have sidestepped that tremendously. There's no politics. It is an invitation to have a relationship, but that doesn't mean you get to barge in and decide how it happens. Nice. You have to learn how to be a good being, let alone a good human being. And how do we learn that? That's one of the very deep conversations um, that is really important. And I ultimately, it only, you could begin, the very first step is start thinking about if I made a decision and had a conversation and had a wish, what would it look like if I was seven or 13 generations into the future? Why, what is going to be important? What is the most important piece? Um, it changes how you see things if you think of it from a different direction. And in that, there's no need to have a division or think about ethics. Um, it's about respect. Mm -hmm. Beautifully said. We're going to explore more of this and have you back in our next season, Charlene, because you have so much to share. And like you say, a big conversation. We want to hear more from you. Yes. Thank you. That's a great start. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to jump into another question. This one's from Kathy Code. What is your view on civil disobedience, which usually involves good people protesting and defying enforcement authority for the good of society? Civil disobedience such as that at Ferry Creek is an attempt to act on behalf of the public good when government won't. So um, what I could say is that there is a justice system that we have 
for the most part to live under if you are from Western society view. That justice system benefits business and it benefits governance. That is not anything to do with the reality of, in a different way, a different set of glasses. And it's two systems that have clashed. And there is a whole group of people who are trying so hard to be helpful and supportive. And I appreciate that to no end. Still, there is a dichotomy. There is a dichotomy we're forced into as opposed to simply stating, this is my relatives. I am standing here. I'm standing up for my grandma. If we could hear it from that point of view, how, how could that conversation be different? I love what Charlene said. Definitely there's room for just an entirely different perspective of how to approach this. But the way that I've been brought up living in Vancouver and everything, I, I you know, in Vancouver, there's so many environmental activist groups, which I think is so amazing. Like, I think we have a really good base of that, not even just in Vancouver, but in BC in general. And the way I see it, um, having volunteered for many different kinds of groups, some that work on direct action and some that work more so on like the policy and research side, is that there's kind of room for everyone and we really need to be making these shifts and these changes in every single field and in every kind of direction and form of action possible because obviously just what we're doing right now is not really working in terms of helping us avoid, uh, you know, the most catastrophic effects of climate change. And so direct action, I think, is wonderful and amazing. And I have been involved with direct, direct action in the past. And I really respect what's going on in Fairy Creek right now, because it's definitely necessary. But I don't think any of that is mutually exclusive. And there's lots of other ways to help um, and lots of other ways to see the issue. But I think it's all really important. And it's every form of action is really necessary. So direct action is one thing that we absolutely need because we need that pressure to be put on the government and we need these decisions to be made quickly and need to have bodies that show how many people care about these issues. But then there's room for so many other forms of activism. And I really encourage people to do whatever they're able to do because not everyone's able to do the same form of activism. You know, some people that might be mothers are pregnant or that are in university or uh, you know embarking on their careers they might not feel like they can put their physical bodies on the line uh, and there's room for them to do something else and we all really need to be working on this from every single perspective there needs to be like environmental engineers working on solutions as well as climate scientists and then people working on the humanities and then activists that are doing direct action so i think there's room for everybody mm -hmm. So Francis, can I just add something to sure. this? Yeah. So it's, you know, hanging around with Suzuki, it used to really drive me crazy that people would talk about him like he was like a radical. And over time, what I realized was that <laughs> wasn't David that was the radical. It was the people who didn't realize that what he was talking about was like super important. And, and I remember when I was a kid, when I was starting out in public relations, I had a mentor who used to say, if you don't tell them, someone else will, then it will be bad. And, and what he was saying was, you need to own your, uh, your narrative. You need to own your voice. And you need to make your voice big. So, so whatever way you do it, that is really important because the voice that is dominating is wrong. And the values that are incorporated in that voice are wrong. But we don't change it by getting stuck in a it, we too much in a fight with it right you you want the you want the narrative to grow beyond it to where it should be right so that people understand who the radicals are the radicals are the people who who want to cut down all this old growth forest the radicals are the people who want to warm the climate right this is super radical Thank you, Jim, and everyone. Uh, next question. Well, trolls, bots, and disinformation factories uh, shut down and pollute the public discourse. Do you have any suggestions beyond ignoring them? 
Um, that actually ties in with another question. I'm just going to see if the medium is the message. How do you get some of these new messages out when the medium remains divided and polarized by design? That's exactly what I said earlier is um, if you are going to allow yourself to be a directed bullet because you are going to be triggered by the things that are happening, you have to have your own strong mind regardless of the prejudice and harm that I've experienced in the variety of ways um, and, and the harm that continues even today, um, you make a choice in how you behave. I'm not here being angry with all of you here. I'm not giving it all back to you. I'm here saying, do better. Inviting you, think like a great grandparent. And in that, you're not going to be bullied. You're not going to think about things, how media and those that are wanting you to be directed bullets. Do you, do you really want to act that way? You are responsible. You saddle your great grandbabies, grandbabies by your actions today. You set them on the pathway. And, and if you don't take responsibility for you, then you allow yourself to be that bullet. However the bullet is, you allow that. Thank you. Thank you. Another question. I'm just going to move to another one. There's so many of them. Um, have any of you experienced someone in your orbit um, change their mind about climate change and its reality? And if so, why did they change their mind? I had somebody. I, I used to belong to a book club with three ex-department uh, heads of philosophy. <laughs> and we would sort of sit down. We'd read these philosophy books. And they're all like super smart guys. And one of them was somebody who um, was basically thought climate change was, I shouldn't worry about it. He said, you should kind of calm. He's a very nice guy and super smart guy. And so I basically arranged for him to have lunch with me and the head of picks. And uh, the, so here's like a, you know, like one of the leading voices in British Columbia on climate change. And he basically walked through all of the arguments and concerns and, one by one. And this guy is like a super rational guy. And in the end, he totally understands now the climate change is the problem. He went from thinking that it was an exaggeration and listening to climate change uh, denial advocates to someone, and it happened in like a few days. Wonderful. Anyone else want to jump in on that one? Yeah, I think a uh, comment on a more gradual process, I guess. When I was in school, as I mentioned, I was always active in all these clubs, but even when I was in high school, I was the only person in my grade up until I was in grade 11 that was in the environmental club at my school. And so I've seen a really big shift with youth. I feel like it's become a lot more of, yeah. I, I want to avoid saying a trend, but it's just become a lot more normalized for people to care about the environment. And I think that leading by example and seeing other people's behaviors change and also becoming more accessible have all influenced that. So I would say there's a lot of things nowadays that are more normalized, like thrift shopping is something that has become extremely normalized. And it's a, a very, it can be a very environmental act if that's how you think of it. And I think it's really amazing to see how much more that's become normalized literally in five or six years since I was in high school. So I really do think that leading by example and also showing people that these changes can be positive and can bring a lot of positivity into your life. So again, something like thrift shopping, I think one of the reasons it's attracted a lot of people is because a lot of uh, these influencers that have really you know, desirable style and that people think look really cool are doing thrift shopping. And that makes other people not just see thrift shopping as an environmental act, but knowing that they'll actually gain something from it. So they'll gain a unique style and, you know, they'll save money from it. And so associating all of these and amplifying all these positives that come with doing these environmental actions and then leading by example and showing people that you're doing it uh, because we're really behavior, we're creatures that follow by influence, you know, like when someone else does something, we want to do it too. So uh, I think showing that these actions have positive outcomes that might not even be related to the environment and also showing that they are easy to do. I and think that's, really that's great. And that's why I think you joined Creatively United, Ella, because we are a solutions hub. 
and you really like the message that there's lots of solutions, lots of positive people to connect with there. You know, you can find out about events that are happening on Creatively United. You can use the resources, you can post to it. Um, there's so many ways to find this information here. And I would like to say, because we've had quite a few people mention like, and say that this should be in the schools, feel free to use any of this information. We have downloadable, shareable resources free of charge. And you can post your own events. Everything's free. There's no membership. And our video replays, as I mentioned, are on Creatively United's YouTube channel. So those are also free for people to use as examples, bring to their classrooms, have these discussions, take the information. So because we're getting really close to the end of the hour, I'm, I'm going to say thank you to our panelists. Thank you for your questions. And just want everyone to know that your questions that weren't answered today, we will have those answered with the replay and Jim, everybody, Ella, Naomi and Charlene, thank you. you. I know that you'll be willing to answer the questions we didn't get to and we'll post it with the video replay. And I really want to acknowledge Jonathan or Reardon because this entire series is made freely accessible and possible thanks to donations from our viewers, sponsors, and our climate and the arts partner, Jonathan or Reardon, who honors the legacy of his late wife, Gail or Reardon, a beloved professional cellist through this eclectic variety of thought-provoking programming. So thank you, Jonathan, and welcome. And Tell us, where do we go from here? Well, thank you, Francis. What a wonderful conversation. I'm sure G uh, Gail would just have loved to be part of this over the last hour and a half. Just want to remind folks that over the last three months, we've presented 10 webinars, a number de dealing with how we've reduced carbon and energy, transportation, housing, some on reg regenerative agriculture. And we've also looked at how we store carbon more effectively through biodiversity, water security, and dealing with permafrost. And we've engaged creative artists and moral thinkers in the way we say that truth is important and all of our artists who have contributed to a series. But now when we do some research that Jim has talked about, we find out that the society is divided into two groups on the dealing with the climate change. One is where there is some level of positive engagement. These are people who are alarmed, cautious, or concerned about climate. They represent roughly 64% of the population in North America. And then there's those who are negatively engaged. They're either disengaged, doubtful, or dismissive. And they represent roughly 36% of the population. So we have an inherent divisive social divide in the way we deal with the climate crisis. So here's a challenge that we're gonna look at in the next series. Um, since over the last 30 years, since the first UN conference on climate, the globe has increased its carbon footprint by 60%. And we're yet we're trying to say that in the next 30 years, we're going to decrease our carbon footprint by 80%. But so there are big stakes that we have to face and the consequences are large if we fail. So how do we approach this? Well, one is that we can now embark on more enlightened conversations. And this conversation today has shown us many ways that which we can break down some of the divisiveness and start to build bridges and collective thinking. We're gonna also look at uh, three countries that are committed to major changes in the way they approach their carbon crisis. UK is committed to reducing their carbon footprint by 78% by 2030. Uh, the US is now reducing its carbon footprint by 50% by 2030. And Canada is committed to reducing its carbon footprint by 40% to 45% by 2030. So these are big issues. They're gonna be right on us in November of 2021. So we're gonna track what progress has been made, what challenges are being faced and how they're getting there. The opportunities are twofold. One, there's better technology, more effective technology, more universal application of technology now than ever was in the last 30 years. So we have the opportunity to actually create uh, the, these reductions. And secondly, there's a shift towards biodiversity and protecting conservation and maintaining it functional ecosystems and at least 50% of our land and water base. So we need to create a dialogue in the, the next fall to see how we approach this UN conference with these three countries. And we also want to demonstrate what actions you, the viewers, can take in order to reduce your carbon footprint. And we're going to be working with our geeky team to see how we can 
track your carbon footprint so you can measure how successful you were able to save a ton in 21. But we also need to bring a new language to the way we converse. That was clearly from today's conversations and the fabulous statements made by Charlene. And we need to have that language emboldened by the creative arts so that we are much more engaged in collective action rather than divisive action. But the rewards are fabulous. If we can actually make progress, look what we can look for in a brighter future, that humanity is working collectively instead of divisively, that humanity is now in touch with nature, that there's a higher level of social justice around the globe, and that we have a stronger level of collective consciousness. We could learn a lot that we learned a year ago when we all faced a crisis, first crisis of the pandemic, and there was a lot of collective consciousness of working together. We need to recreate that sense of, of crisis so that we can reconnect and enjoy making progress together. So it's gonna be an exciting journey as we reach this road to carbon neutrality. We're looking forward to seeing you all again in the fall and following our new series of workshops. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to our audience and our panelists. We are so grateful. See you next fall. And in the meantime, enjoy all the video replays you can find on creativelyunited.org or Creatively United on YouTube. There you go. Bye for now. Thank you. <laughs>